interested people watch obsessed people change the world. Mm -hmm. I love that quote. And when I look at you, I see someone who's obsessed in your field. Well, our next guests are causing a fitness frenzy. Sydney-based entrepreneurs Jade Spooner and Amal Wakim lost a combined 50 kilos in weight between them. I know that you and Amal achieved Forbes 30 under 30. Overall, I think loneliness was the, the common denominator in that period of time and those feelings. I know that there's a life that is meant to be lived and I'm not living it. I am becoming me and not Jade from Evolution, which was yeah. a big discovery process for myself. I, just, I think it's just so important to wake up and love what you do. G'day, g'day. Welcome back to another episode of A Lot To Talk About. It's your boy, the captain of the ship, the man in charge, Bradley J. Driver. Of course, you can call me Brad. And I always say it, but very grateful to be here having another conversation with an incredible guest. Today's guest is a little bit different to the few of last. We're talking entrepreneur, founder, and this lady has been the founder of two incredible businesses. Um, we're going to dive into both of those today. So from your home, your car, or wherever you are, give a very warm welcome to the one, the only, the incredible Jade Spooner. Thank you. That was the best intro I've ever heard about myself. It was hey, lovely. You deserve it. You deserve it. We <laughs> always go freestyle with the intro, so I never know what's going to come out. Yeah, well, the, I was happy with that. You can record that and play that back to we might even my do friends a little and hype. family. We'll do a little hype clip for you for the fam and friends. Yeah, that was good. That was so good. good to have you here. Thank you for having me. Cool studio that we're shooting in today. Yeah, well, I want to give a shout out to Den and Kemp, bloke yeah. in the bar, for letting us use the bloke HQ. Very kind of him. It's actually a year ago that I was here shooting with him, yeah, so it's actually nice saying. to be back. It's nice to be a little bit nostalgic sometimes, yeah. hey, and just look back. And you know what I don't mind? I don't mind like a little park interview, like where yeah, you go yeah. out into the park and like it's a little bit something out, bit of ambience. Yeah, nice. Yeah, you're nice. lapelled up, but Sydney weather at the moment I is know, not predictable. It's not turning it on, is it? We I feel like we just blinked and summer became winter. Yeah, it's, I know. But we can't complain. Actually, I had a, a call with a client this morning who's in Melbourne, and she said it's been dark there like London vibes so I feel like we can be grateful for a bit of light and sun I lived in Melbourne and I often go back to look at the photos I lived there for a year yeah and I'm so pasty yeah. in every photo so I'm so grateful well, that's big for you to say because you yeah. got quite a tan yeah exactly <laughs> so, so, so saying that the weather mustn't been bloody ass it's tough hey yeah. it's so nice to have you on Thank I really you. want to dive into your story today I think yeah the thing that stands out for me the most with you is there's this incredible self-belief that drives everything you do in business and I want to really kick it off with a quote, a quote that I heard on a podcast the other day. I'm not sure if you know Tim Grover. Yep. So Tim, for those of you listening, watching, is the author of a book called Relentless and a few others. Yeah. He was the trainer behind the great Michael Jordan and the late, great Kobe Bryant. And he was on a podcast called Diary of a CEO, yep. which is my favorite yep. show at the moment. And he had this quote that just, it was so profound. It stood out to me. He said, Interested people watch obsessed people change the world. Mm -hmm. I love that quote. And when I look at you, I see someone who's obsessed in your field. But I wanted to ask you, is it business that's your obsession or is it building something from the ground up? Yeah, well, it's funny you ask that because you've caught me at a very funny time. And I'm going to make it my mission to look back at this podcast in sort of 18 months time when the dust has settled and just remember sort of this moment because... Yeah, I do. I do think that when I started my first company, Equolution, it was real obsession, you know, like inherently when you have to run a business, you get this knack of just having to understand business. But for a lot of people, it doesn't sort of come naturally. You learn on the job. And the more I think I learned on the job, the more that it was business that fascinated me, not exactly mm. the space that I was in. And that was a really hard realization. That's like, marrying someone and realizing you don't love them you know sort of halfway through the marriage but I you know it had its great it had a great run I was in that business for eight years and then just recently sold so you know there was always an obsession but I mm. think you know for me personally business has become a bit of like in, in my heartbeat I think it's what what's pumping everything because you really live and breathe it right I do I really do and I think that it also just came from when I moved out of Equolution when I left the business, um, I left and obviously did, left my wage and and I wasn't sort of pulling a dividend. I decided to, to go up for sale essentially. Um, so I had to make a living again. You know, I had to, mm. I had to start, start again. I didn't know how long the transaction would take and I just sort of, you know, put that aside. The fact that I'd done that and maybe, you know, money was coming and I, I just forgot about that and I just sort of said I have to start again. And 
when I went to essentially start again, I was like, well, I, I know business, you know, that's the thing that I know. So I'm, <laughs> that's where I'm going, you know, that's, and then the, it was the more that I, I chatted to people and the more that I was helping operators, founders, you know, people that were really passionate, but didn't pot- potentially have the experience that I'd had. When I was seeing them get results from things that I was telling them, I was like, okay, this is that feeling that people chase when they decide what they want to do with their lives, you know? And, you know, I just essentially went from one business to another. So I love it. Yeah. That's kind of how that happened. It's interesting to hear you say there, like when you left and then you've dived into this now, Mm. what was that period in between? Like, was that hard? Yeah, geez, it was. It was, it was really difficult because... Anyone who knows me and, and, and any podcast you, you, you listen to with, with me on it and I'm talking about Equolution, my old company, you can hear in my voice that I'm passionate. So I, I was really passionate about nutrition and then it just kind of, it all started wearing really thin for me and I, mm. I got really bored. You know, a startup and a scale up are really different. You touched on something before about, you know, is it building something? Is it starting something up from the ground that, that does it for you? And I think very much so, yes. Um, I was looking at the scale up journey and, and you know, we had like a product roadmap in, in place for, for the tech product itself. And then there was a marketing plan and there was, you know, a go to market strat- strategy for international expansion and all this stuff. And I just thought, I know this is a terrible thing to say and it's, but with all honesty, I just thought I'm not interested. And yeah. it was a really, it was a really hard kind of reality and I think a lot of people talk about you know what it feels like to build a business and but not many people talk about what it feels like to fall out of love with it so similarly when I was in that position I was like god am I like an alien of is this a normal feeling but now going through the sale yeah like if you're a serial entrepreneur which I think Mm. I believe that I've fallen into you know that category the fact that you know, something can close and I can start something up that is sort of heading the same way in terms of business size, then maybe, yeah, that's, that's you know, how the, the cookie crum- crumbles, you know. I love the way that you explain that then because I can probably relate in somewhat way. Yep. Like I was in real estate for three and a half years and my career was like nicely progressing. Yep. And I got to a point just before the money started to get really good where I was about to capitalise and really kick off work. into that next phase, yep. which was like, I guess where all the treats and the rewards start to come for the hard work. And my bosses sat me down when I resigned and were like, you really need to consider this and think about it for a couple of months because you're about to enter a phase where in five years we could see you being that million dollar agent. Yep. And I was like, I'm just not interested. Not into it. Yeah. I just don't have a love and a passion for it. And I think anyone who started something from the ground up, kind of like I've done with this, and this is obviously on a very different scale to owning a business and pouring the money into that, but you realize that it is so tough to start again yeah. that if you've got the guts to go again, you must love it. There yeah, must be 100%. a real passion. Or you must have a love for loving what you do. And I think, you know, I look at the position that I was in when I left and it was real easy. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. You know, yeah. like being up up the top with, you know, 30 staff and, you know, it, it happens quite naturally on a sales front for, for that business. And um, it, it was it was pretty cruisy you know it was um not a, there was not a lot of pressure we were the um 50 50 co-founders so there was no one on any boards pointing fingers asking questions mm. um we were running a business along a trajectory to where we envisioned it to to go and um for me personally where i left was where i wanted to take it and i think that was another reality as well sort of realizing well why did I start this? And I really wanted to create this product that kind of um, manifested everything that we knew from a knowledge perspective of flexible dieting and show people how they can have their cake and eat it too. And whilst I didn't reach the numbers that I wanted to get it to, in my opinion, the my part in the journey was done when I decided to leave. So I think that's a big part as well. It's like, you know, feeling that your time is done is, is one thing, but knowing it's done is another. And I was pretty sure when I left, I knew that, you know, rebuilding was going to be challenging. I don't think I really knew what I was in yeah. for until I started going again. But now I'm five months into a new business. We've got six staff. It's Love not it. It's not where I left my other one right, right now, but, you know, it's on its way. Like it's, it, mm. I, have no, I have full confidence that it'll do it again. So I think, yeah, that pursuit of happiness is, I feel something you've got to honour. Um, commercial if you're a commercial person if you're someone that makes sound financial decisions and you know if you've if you've kind of um become accustomed to like a 
a bracket of living that, and, and a standard of living that is in that, you know, high performer category where you're earning de- a decent wage, et cetera, et cetera. I think that will always sustain itself. You know, to have to really throw your hands in the air to, to not sustain that. Um, there's obviously got to be an inherent drive in that individual to be at that level. Um, I knew that that was probably always going to stay around, but I think the happiness factor was at one point far more important to me, um, which, yeah, it's nice to say that that's yeah. what I chased. I love that so much because the thing that I've begun to realise, and, and I think it's just age and ma- yeah. maturity teaches you this, as you go through more experiences, I remember starting in my former corporate career and thinking when I get to these numbers or this level, that then I'll be happy. Something. Yeah, Like 100%. I was almost thinking that that was going to be the thing that equaled yeah. happiness for me and you know, I make no money right now. Yeah. Like I'm just absolutely hustling to try and It'll make come. this happen. And yeah, but, but weirdly watching my account drain every week, I've still got the same smile on my face yeah. because I know eventually it will. And I know that the act of doing something you love and putting action behind intent and knowing you're on the right path, it, it just gives you so much more happiness than it does sitting in something that's successful but doesn't drive you but anymore. But probably even, you, you might even get more of a drive, you know, from from really going like this to pick back up and go back up there from a a financial perspective. But yeah, I do believe, I'm a big believer in consistency and I do think that that always pays off and and in the work front, it surely will, um, you know, if you've got your your eyes on the prize and you're creating like incremental milestones to get to that bigger goal. And and I do think that, yeah, it's just about sort of dedicating the time and you, you as a resource to that pursuit. Um, it sounds a bit like a fairy tale. Like I know it doesn't always work out like that for, for people, but I, I do believe that hard work pays off. I think consistency pays off too. Definitely. Yeah. It yeah. seems to me that you're incredibly self-aware. Like when you speak about making these decisions and pivoting, there's this real sense of knowing what you want, what yeah. you require as a human to be happy. And, and that um, can change too. Definitely. Yeah. I'm really interested. The thing that stood out to me the most, like I watched your interview with Ice. That was yep. the first time I'd come across your story. Yeah. The thing that stood out the most was the journey to begin with equ- Equolution. Mm-hmm. You had so much self-belief to go yep. and do it the way that you did. Were you quite an introspective person before going into business or is that something you've developed along the way? I think, look, I think there's people that are born with something. You know, a lot of people who have that thing can't quite put their finger on it. They know they're a little bit different. Mm. You know, um, relationships with people look different. You know, I was always the kid that had like older friends, you know, like I worked in, in retail and one of my best girlfriends, I just looked up to her so much and she was about five years older than me and she was studying law and I just thought she was the bee's knees. You know, I just had yeah. like a lot of people around me that I kind of looked up to. Um, my dad's brother was hugely successful and both my parents are entrepreneurs, but like hustler entrepreneurs, like yeah. real, you know, they, they gave it ev- their everything. Um, and some weeks just got by and then some weeks they, ha- they made their breaks. But I just had a lot of people around me that I helped, I think helped identify that... Um, like this the the striver in me you know as so, a kid were you like quite entrepreneurial like were you ever trying to sell stuff or because yeah. you hear gary v like a guy like that talks about it a lot yeah you know garage sailing selling yeah. baseball cards was that something that you identified yeah. in your childhood myself and my former business partner amal as well so um when i was 18 i used to do flyer promotions and yeah. i had a i was with an agency and they put me on a job for anytime fitness and i was doing the flyers and i came in at the end of my shift and i gave the the owner back the the remaining flyers that i had and he said how'd you go and we're just having having a chat and i said if you don't mind me asking how much are you uh, paying for me per hour to the agency and he said $65 and I died I was getting 20 and I was like no way and I was like that margin though like hello that's like it just sort of struck me that he was a I feel getting ripped off and yeah. b so was I <laughs> yeah so I said to him I said can we cut a sweet deal I said if I can get you some girls to do flyers that are you know fit and in shape etc I said can you give the work to me and he said, yeah, and I've got some other mates that own a few other Anytime Fitnesses. I can give you their facilities as well. And I thought, sweet. So I hired my girlfriends out at 40 bucks an hour and I gave them 25 and I was making $15 an hour per person. I love um, it. Yeah, and that was like, that was my first job. And my, my former business partner, Amal, was the same. Her dad 
did imports and imports and exports and he imported a bunch of hair straighteners branded it as her own and she ho- so, sold hair straighteners at Westfields in those little stalls um over the the Christmas holidays and school holidays and stuff so both yeah I think it's something that you have in you definitely and it just takes that one thing you know and I I, I see that now um sort of you know replicated as I'm a little bit older in this going from this business growing it eight years heart and soul put it everything I had into it did that you know valuation process which is a like a hugely humbling experience um and then sold the shares in that so I do think that you know some people have just got that yeah Definitely. hustle <laughs> the Definitely. hustle I love isn't it. it I love it yeah and it's like it's just DNA and like I look back at me as a child and it, it doesn't surprise me that I just want to chew people's ears were off your now. parents the same what would they do they my parents see system? very different like my parents were dad was a cop yeah and mum was in like sales and retail and mum was like gun at what she done which is doesn't surprise me why I ended up in real estate yeah because I yeah. think mum was always selling yeah. something and then but but I'm definitely the most outspoken extroverted character yeah. in my family but from as young as I can remember, it was probably their encouragement to involve me in conversation yeah. that just any time we had family friends around, like the kids were doing their thing and I was at the table with the parents Talking asking questions off, yeah. and just like telling well, stories. Well, it's like that. It's like what I was saying before about gravitating to the older generation yeah. when you're still like a kid. I think, you know, I've always laughed that there's been like an old soul living inside of me. and <laughs> I've just Definitely. always, you know, I've always thought of that thing, you know, sort of identifying with that older older decade to what I always was you know a hundred percent yeah when you talk about that relationship with Amal and the way that you Mm. guys were both very similar in your youth I think there's probably a little bit of curiosity (laughs) from a listener watcher's point of view where anytime you start a business with somebody or you Mm -hmm. go into something as a pair like there's a little bit of nerve because it's like have I known this person for long enough are we similar enough do we have different strengths and weaknesses for you, like, what was that relationship like before business and what made you go, this is my person to do this with? Well, the thing was um, we sort of connected and just – it was kind of like an unspoken covenant that we had that we were just going to do this thing together, you know. Yeah. Um, we were also really young and with, you know, youth, there's a bit of naivety there as well. Um, and I, I love that innocence. You know, I would hate to have known what I know now in terms of, you know, the way – things can end up or the legalities or ins and outs and stuff and enter business that way Mm. because I think it really does you know I'll give you an example my new business partner Jenna just entered our partnership with all the excitement in the world whereas I just come from you know the the share sale of my business so I had a lot of due diligence that I was doing that she wasn't even thinking about because she was so excited about the partnership and you know, I, I love that. That's how the, that's how they should start. Similarly to how, you know, you might get screwed over by someone and then decide you never love's never for you again. Well, that's not, yeah. that's not right, you know. So sure. I think that, you know, it, it can take away from the excitement of it when you, re- when you really overthink it and just try and excuse yourself from that feeling of, well, I don't know why, but it just feels right. And I think I really had that when I was young with Amal, you know, it, and to this day, you know, um, yes, our, our paths didn't, you know, simultaneously end at the same destination, but we were the right people for the job and the chapters, you know, aligned when they were meant to align. Yeah, I love so, that. yeah, I do think that I think due diligence is very important when entering a new partnership. And I think the curiosity of, you know, what is the worst case scenario? How much do I see this person being attached to my hip for an extremely long period of time indefinitely? I think all those questions are normal and I encourage those questions, but I still think that, you know, don't don't let it eat away at the fun of it. Yeah. You've and got, and the, those feelings. You've almost got it. Like you said, I love what you said about like that naivety because mm-hmm. I talk about it a lot when I started this show, which is just over two years ago now. I remember thinking I've got so much self-belief yeah and I just and that's probably a factor of my parents just like everything I do they just built back I'm the best 100%. At it. Like, yeah my dad would be down the pub going mate my son's got a podcast if you've heard of Joe Rogan Brad's way better yeah yeah like yeah, he just yeah. pumps me up like that so when I started this I was like I'll be bigger than Rogan in a year yeah yeah so foolish no and it sounds so naive but 
it's probably what powered me. And I think along the way, I just loved it so much. It really spoke to the core of who I was yeah. that even if the results didn't align with that, I was happy to keep putting yeah. one foot in front of the other. Are you happy you made the plunge? You took oh, the plunge now? So happy. Yeah. Like my life, it's funny because I was often a person who so much self-belief, but I always put other people first. Yeah. And I was, I, I still remember the day that I quit my work and I had a great relationship with. There's and something I, liberating about that. So liberating. Mm. It, it felt like a 200 kilo weight had yeah. been dropped off my shoulders. Like I remember walking into the office with my old boss and I told him and I was so emotional about it because it wasn't, <coughs> excuse me, it wasn't, it wasn't emotional because it was, the it was emotional. Decision. It was emotional because it was like, I was finally Empowering. doing something for me. Yeah, I get that. I was I like, fully get oh, that. that's so uplifting. I get and that. I look at the last two years of my life and so many incredible things have happened that wouldn't have if I was still stuck in that headspace and that mindset and like even just new directions in my life. Like I founded a charity event and raised a bunch of money for charity That's and cool. just like the direction of my life, the trajectory has changed forever. Yeah. And it was off the back of that one decision because I am so confident had I had not made that, I would have been stuck in yep. that space still. Yeah. I think that's the moral of the story, isn't it? It's like you, something inside, I think your intuition is always like mini guardian angels kind of Definitely. orating around you sort of thing. And I think if you've got this like, you know, there's this feeling and, or something's off. You've got to listen to those feelings. And, you know, the more you just pack it all away, it'll resurface at, at some point or another. Um, yeah, I, I very much believe that. To quote my last podcast guest, Cooper Chapman, he had an amazing message at the end of the show and he said, the act of confidence comes before the feeling of confidence. Mm. And I love that because it, it quite it's often true. is take that leap and you'll figure it out along yeah, the way. It, that's really true. Talk about taking the leap. Yeah. There's a, a monumental part of the Equolution story mm -hmm. where you and Amal head over to the US. Mm -hmm. You mind sharing with us, I guess, what the motivation behind the craziness. that was? <laughs> yeah. Um, parents would just probably like plug their ears and be like, oh my God, her parents would have yeah. been having a semi-heart attack. <laughs> they were in their own way, but similarly like yours, I was really well supported through everything I did. Same with Amal as well. So we sort of attribute a lot of you know, just the ease in decision-making to the fact that we were so supported. Um, we both had jobs at Google, um, six-figure salaries. Like We were just really cushiony there. Uh, there was obviously a prospective future um, in that company and it was a great company to work with for. It was everything that you yeah. think Google will be. It is. Like the movie. Yeah, it's yeah. unreal. It's, it's really cool. Anyway, so we both had jobs there and we were running Equolution on the side and we kind of toyed with the idea of quitting our jobs to pursue it full time. We spoke to our third business partner about it at the time. This is very early stages within six months of starting the business. And he said, I'm not interested. Like you girls take this and you, you know, you guys do it. So three became two and yep. we, we pursued it on our own. And one day I just pinged a mile at Google and I said, um, I've quit. It's your turn. And so she pulled her manager aside. She's like, oh, shit, you just throw me in the deep end. You know, <laughs> she wasn't ready. She was ready, but, like, yeah. she wasn't ready that moment. And so I just did it one day. She did it the same day. And then, uh, you know, we worked at Google. So Silicon Valley was the tech hub of the world. So we took a one-way ticket um, and just didn't really look back. But we had no idea what we were going to do when we got there. Zero, like. So there was no planned conference no. or, I love that. There was nothing. In fact, when we got over there, we were like, we have to do something with ourselves over here. Yeah. Um, originally, we thought we'd start Equolution in the US, but one thing you learn about business pretty early on is it's so important to know your customer more than anything. Yep. You need to know your customer. And our Australian customer was not our American customer. They were different customers. Okay. So that was pretty pivotal for us because we got over there and we're like, where the hell do we start? You know, if we create an American database, we can't bring it back home. Yeah. Similarly, if, you know, we start in Australia, America's going to be a beast that we're going to have to tackle later later down the track. But anyway, we had all these questions and not a lot of answers and our money was running real short. And um, we found a conference, like it was called the Startup Grind. It was powered by Google. And this was going back maybe eight years ago. Yep. Um, tickets were a couple of grand each. It was a bit of a bit of a punt for us, but we thought there'll be answers at this conference. There mm. was meet and greets and networking um, p 
periods blocked out for, for mingling and whatnot. We thought we'll catch a break here. So we went to this conference and it was one of the most incredible events I've ever been to because we heard from so many, you know, amazing entrepreneurs of companies that even now I still look up to them, you know, Uber, um, mm. Twitter, it was yeah, just wow. all in one room that probably it wouldn't happen these days. You know, it was just, it was such an iconic time and we were there. And one thing that we got from that was just a bit of fire in the belly because our story was so similar. It was like problem solution to one to two founders with a vision and a skill set. And we were like, the ingredients is there. It's a blueprint, then, right? A hundred percent. And then we got poached kind of like in one of the networking sessions. We stood out like sore thumbs. There were mostly blokes there and then <laughs> and just us. And then um, we got pulled sort of out of the crowd. We met the, this group of guys and they were from this Texas accelerator program. And they pitched to us and they wanted, I think, 20% or something for a particular sum of money that was they just pulled out of the air but it was considerable like it was we never th considered the offer but it was like a considerable sum that kind of gave us a bit of validation that like we're on to something just that little confidence little, little confidence large. booster yeah and we were making money at the time not a lot um but we just decided then and there that it was time to come home and to, you know grow the business in the place that we we mm. knew best we also got an idea and an understanding that to create an app, which is not as easy then as it is today, we'd need to find either a CTO, and that's a big part of why we went over there as well. We thought we'd just miraculously meet our CTO somewhere. Um, and it's funny because eight years on, we only just put a CTO on last year. So okay. it's like... <laughs> it so was, can I ask, is a CTO, is that like chief tech chief, officer? Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. So that's like your man that... If you don't know how to build an app, he will and he'll okay. he'll manage the people and, and the project and, and make sure the thing gets done. Um, coding is sort of like handwriting, like some people have messy writing and some people have neat yeah. writing and it's almost like handwriting in another language for, for you and I to look at. You know? okay, yeah. So it's a real um, sort of unknown territory for non-technical founders like Amal and myself. So, yeah, we went over there seeking some tech advice and you know just a, a somebody or whatever and we learned that the app was going to cost us hundreds of thousands of dollars and months and months and it did but we had to come home and make that to pay for it I guess so that's I exactly love what that. we did because there's the, just to hear that that would turn most people away like most people would go okay we'll cut our ties here you know it was fun while it lasted but that's such an investment yeah it was it was a huge investment investment even now, you know, 18 months on, a lot of people are like, oh, who did your app and how long does it take? I get messages like that all the time, which I love. I welcome, or I will always give my honest yeah. advice and, and feedback and whatnot. But whenever I, I get that question, I, I think maybe it does startle a lot of people. You know, it took 18 months to build. It's still not to mm. where we wanted it to go. And we're talking millions of dollars. So it was a huge leap of faith and... A, a, a gamble I guess you could say because we just believed in it so much yeah um and yeah you know I think it, it did pay like we were right you know we had that there was a thing the whole way along we had validation and proof of concept because people were paying for our service and our service just wasn't getting serviced exactly as we wanted it to because the user experience we envisioned was to be in the app yep. whereas we we're doing everything manually but we were just, we knew like it was, the proof was in the pudding, yeah. Talk to me about, like I'm not, I'm not very business minded, like mm -hmm. I'm definitely more of a creative sort of brain, mm -hmm. but I'm interested because even from the point of this podcast, I always think about like you've met Fooney here today, the audience would know Fooney, but Fooney's definitely no tech wizard. Mm -hmm. He's definitely not the CTO of <laughs> what to talk about. But I always think like, would it be worthwhile having someone who runs all of that like edits does the production so I can focus on conversation. But I'm always fascinated by business owners and founders as to when they find is the right time to put on staff and to hire. Like, yeah. is it before you need it or is it string it out for as long as you can? Oh, it's a, it's a toughie because I think without experience, it's a hard question to answer. And, you know, to get experience, you need to kind of understand the space. So for that reason, I would say, you know, business by business, it's always, my answer yeah. would obviously always change. Um, but I think from, from my 
personal journey. I'm um, not sure I understand. <laughs> Siri doesn't S- get Siri's it. Siri's getting around. Siri's not getting it. Um, I think for my own personal journey, so in Equolution, it took us a long time to hire our first our first staff yeah. member, which was my sister, by the way. Yeah, nice. Um, so it took us a, a fair while to hire her and it was through utter desperation of not no offence to Zara or anything like that, but it was just like we can't physically – do this we can't physically take on the work like we were doing 20 hour days and it was so hard and so taxing and we were like you know 23 24 our whole early 20s just were passing by and we just didn't get a minute to breathe and it was literally not until demand outweighed supply that we were like we've got to put someone on and then from there we sort of built the confidence to kind of grow a team but in my opinion, looking back at that journey, way way too slow. Just for that business, yeah. for me at the time, I wish I had the now knowledge back then um, because now I have hired real quick. You know, as soon as I just saw that things were getting quite hefty in terms of workload, um, I started hiring straight away. And differently to how I previously hired, I previously hired based on need. Now I hire based on the business's need, like hiring people that are better than me. And that's, I I think that is now what I'm looking at as almost like a skill set because I think growing a team, you have to have kind of an understanding and a perspective of where the gaps are and no ego to be able to say, I shan't be filling those gaps yeah. myself. Well, even you can. play to your strengths, right? Exactly. Exactly. So, you know, even in, in my team now, I, I have people that are smarter than me doing things that I, I don't understand. Um, but I know they need to be done, you know? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. You just said there, you sort of just started touching on the new business. Yep. Firstly, I want to compliment you on your use of business names. You've got great business Thanks. names, <laughs> which I find is always one of the hardest things to do is to name anything. Yeah. So big appetite. Talk yep. to us about basically what that service is and the reason that was the business you wanted to start. Okay. So this was very anti the plan. So okay. this was not the plan. Yeah. This was an accident, but the best accident that sort of ever happened. So I left Equolution. It was a difficult time for me emotionally because whilst everything felt right, I just had this huge fear that like I was, you know, those artists that have that one song and they never come out with a good banger again. I was like, I don't want to be a one hit wonder. (laughs) I just, you know, I had this sort of like, it was just a fear. It was like, it was not the reality because in reality, I was in control of that narrative, but it was really just a fear. I left a really high place and, yeah, you know, it took a lot of years to get there. And I was like, I I don't even, how do you even start again? Yeah. Like, you know, but I think what I had on my side this time was knowledge and wisdom and expertise. And also I wasn't destitute. Like I wasn't, you know, bottom of the barrel scraping for funds. Yeah. Like I'd set myself up. So with that, it made decision making a lot clearer. And I first, the first thing I did was, and this is the like a big part of the reason why I left. I got offered a acting CMO role for body science, and it oh, was wow. just a short three month contract. But it was when I was at Equolution, and I took some leave to do this contract because at the time I was like, I think I got to leave the business. Yeah. I bloody have never even considered this before and this makes me nervous, but it feels right. And if I'm kind of getting wandering eyes and enticed to take this contract and this challenge, then I, I, there's something surely wrong with the current path. So I ended up doing the body science contract, which I loved and it was a great business. And, you know, if I wasn't a founder by heart, I probably could have stayed in that role for a lot longer. But I did that, but I really found that I loved business and that was sort of the start of, I was consulting clients before and after my body science job and they kind of just all came through Instagram. So I had maybe like a dozen on a monthly retainer and then I was doing body science. I was doing full day Saturday, full day Sunday and before and after work consults. Like I was very full, but I was, I was pretty ready for that. When I left Equolution, I felt like I was ready to go. And so I took all that on and I was dealing with all these different businesses and they were all getting results from what I was doing. And I think I lacked confidence in my role at Equolution because I kind of got it to a point where like I was just uninterested in the next phase. Yeah. 
And I also felt like I had exhausted myself in that business. So I felt like I was lacking offer. And then I was growing as an individual business person whilst working with other businesses. And then they were growing due Mm. to my like consulting skills. And I was like, I really, I feel super passionate about this. Not one of those industries, I will always be married to health and fitness, but not one of those industries were like restricted by my past in health and fitness. And they were all capitalizing on just the universality of the business mind, I guess. And the skills, yeah, yeah, that I'd got along the way. So that kind of put me in a category of like, passion for business consulting and you know growth and marketing and scalability in other businesses in all different areas you know what i love about that just to quickly interject Mm. you listen to a lot of people there's a guy who i'm absolutely fascinated by i'm sure you've heard him on diary of a ceo mo gordit yeah 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 and mo speaks you know for those listening who haven't heard me rave about this guy already he speaks about the principles of happiness and like pure happiness. And it seems that anyone you listen to in that space, who's really educated around happiness and what it means to be truly happy and fulfilled and content, there is this huge element of service to others. And you would have had that in Equolution because you were helping people find um, a healthier version of themselves and, and to feel like like that self love and like they're reaching their potential. But in this, it's probably even more direct where it's a direct one-to-one help. Couldn't agree more with you on that. And I think a part of my passion dissolving in the Equolution role was when we turned tech, I got off the tools and I was in marketing and I wasn't coaching anymore. And mm. of course, like, you know, my business is moving. I have to move with it yep. and level up and, you know, start acting from an executive level. But like, I loved being a coach more than anything. And I loved giving what I had created to other human beings and just that interaction, support. The girls that I work with always used to laugh that like, I would just jump in with them and do meal plans and stuff like that. And I had no problem doing that because it's true. Like if, if if you're doing a good job and people love what you're doing and you're a bit of a perfectionist in doing that as well you know you're giving a good service like people will be satisfied and that is satisfying and I was experiencing that in in consulting as well you know it was just it was just all around just like happy days every day you know and gradually I realized I was building something without building something so I kind of had this idea I always had question marks around the scalability you know I'm one human being and if I wanted to do something with this, mind you, I had another tech and I still I still have that, but I have yeah. a, another tech idea that I will be building after this sale transacts. But any, if you know tech, you understand that building an app takes so much time. So like, I'm happy yeah. to, you know, side hustle that whilst I'm, I'm building this business. Um, but anyway, cut a very long story short. I met Jenna at a party and I knew of her because she was great at what she did. She created this this program, like a course called the Fitness Business Strategy. And I'd watched her online for ages. And it's funny because like I, w- I started competing. Like I, di- I was a fitness model, like when we yeah. started in the fitness industry, Amal and I. And um, it's funny because that world didn't interest me at all. But Jenna was very much in it. But I always kept an eye on her. Like she was, I just found her really interesting character. She was exceptional at business. She was very dedicated to the sport of competing, but not in a way that it consumed her. She was very diverse and multifaceted. I just saw the passion in her really. And then we met at a party, obviously a few drinks deep. Yeah. Hey, and she's like, I'm Jenna. I'm like, I know I follow you. She's like, I've just moved down the road. I know, I know yeah. everything about your life. I was like a total fair girl. I'm like, no, I know. I know everything. She's like, she's like, I know of your business, like Equolution, blah, blah, blah. She's like, what are you doing now? We just kind of started chatting and we were doing the same thing. Like yeah. honestly, like we were doing exactly the same thing. She was predominantly health and fitness. So yeah. she was quite renowned for building Mark Carroll, who is a coach in the fitness space, yeah. his business, um, to an eight figure business. And she's, yeah, well. she's quite known for that. And um, so a lot of her clients and target market were, online coaches and personal trainers, which is really funny because I was wanting to build my next platform, We Trained, which is targeted at personal trainers as a business management tool. That's that's what I yeah. kind of wanted to do when I left Equolution. I didn't have consulting in mind. I was just, I would just want a job. I just wanted to work every day. 
So without the sale of Equolution closing, I couldn't move on to build the app. Yeah. So the, tr- the consulting thing was just an interim, but I ended up falling in love with it, met Jenna, we hit it off. And, I love that. And we similarly one day, she said, why don't we do a podcast together? And I was like, all right. But I was thinking, no, we're going to go into business together. I had, I knew, I knew straight away. Yeah. She, I just knew that she needed a little bit of time because she hadn't had a business partner before. And so she came to my house with a spreadsheet and I had butcher's paper up on my windows. Like I had a, a complete like 180, like all windows. And I had butcher's paper around the entire apartment. She walked in, she's like, whoa. I'm like, just hit me out. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, I'd, I'd built like a scalable model. And yeah. she was like, well, I'm selling this. And then we kind of merged the two things and. I love it started working together and we when we started big up a tight probably five months ago i love that because it feels almost somewhat natural it like was it so was natural meant to happen. and i was really fearful uh that that wouldn't happen again because yeah. i know that i know that what happened for, in my evolution journey was a very special experience yep. and i was you know it, it's apples and oranges like it's not it's, it's never going to be the same but I had this, I've had the same feelings again, which is, it's really nice. Cause yeah, special, yeah. yeah, it is. And it's, it's really good. Um, and really our business is just the byproduct of like two brains become one, two brains, one goal, mm. you know, and it's very, very coexisting like the, the two of us. So it's been, um, yeah, it's been great. I have no doubt you're going to have incredible success with this too. One thing that makes me really curious is you mentioned before those 20 hour days Mm -hmm. back in the early Mm -hmm. phases of business one Mm -hmm. is it's hard because you, I feel like there's split ideas on this, but is there such thing as balance of life when it comes to, well, that work life balance when it comes to business? No. (laughs) Yeah. No, I don't think so at one point. And I think yeah. that you can, you know, oh, you got to get your runs on the board and I, and it's hard. Like it really is. And I would not, I, I don't want to go through what I went through to build Equolution and I probably won't have to now because I've been blessed with like, you know, resource and experience, but I had to come from somewhere yeah. and that place, that, that dark place that I refer to as the time that I blinked and like three years had passed but we honestly, we were like 24 year olds that were acting like 65 year olds. Um, we needed to do that. Like that's, yeah. that's what the business needed from us. And I'll do it again now if, it, if it's required. But I just think that I'm a bit more w- equipped now to not have to do yep. that sort of, you know, hustle and grind just because I'm supported in resource I am smart with my time. I work so much smarter than I used to. Like, there's that's no, the key, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. So much smarter, just quicker, real, like, real quick in comparison to, you know, just being younger. And like, we had a vibe in the office. We'd all laugh and have chats and work late nights together. And not to say that, you know, it was, um, it was not hard work. It was, but just a lot more, I think, wise with time now and prioritize. If I can't do it. I will just wrap it up and make sure that I've got the right systems in place where yep. someone else can do things that I can't do quick or I can't do as well as I want them to be done. Um, and that's okay to say that, you know, you just need to hire, you mm. know. Um, but yeah, no, I, I do think that work-life balance is extremely important, but I think it's a process to get to that point of satisfaction and, and really having that balance. For sure. One thing I'm always really interested in when it comes to business-minded people and people who are, like yourself, really successful in these spaces, there's always a real emphasis on goals. Mm -hmm. But I feel like, and I know you're massive into goal setting, like I've listened to, exceptional by the way, some of your podcasts where you talk about goal setting and structuring it. I find that a lot of people in business though forget about that overarching purpose. Of themselves. Yeah, and like who they are as a human. Yeah, is that something you're big on or massive. is it something you're learning along the way? Yeah, no, massive. And I think that it's become more uh, learnt for me in the last sort of six to 12 months since leaving Equolution than probably ever before. Um, I didn't know who I was and what I looked like outside of my business. I had to kind of meet that person, I guess, when I yeah. left. You know, I'd, 
I, I found it really hard to, you know, I go on podcasts and things like that even now and I love, and I've noticed you, you've even done this today, like Equolution's a bit of what we're talking about, yeah. but it's not everything. And it was, it, it, that, that makes me feel really satisfied in knowing that I'm becoming me and not Jade from Equolution, which was yeah. a big discovery process for myself. Um, and in saying that as well, like along the way, I think my priorities just shifted a little bit. I remember like sort of 18 months ago, um, I think you can equally love business and love life as well. I think that's really important to mention. Super important. Yeah. I think it was about 18 months ago, I was, something was wrong. And when I say it was wrong, I mean on paper, everything was right. And I felt off, you know, it was just like this overwhelming sense of like, why does this not feel as good as it's supposed to feel? And Overall, I think loneliness was the, the common denominator in that period of time and those feelings because I was disconnected from my family and friends because I was working so hard. Actually, this did go back maybe like three years to 18 months ago, that bracket of time. I was working, I was always in the office. Like I was yeah. forever just equilution girl, you know? Yeah. And I was not really much else. And I just feel like I was getting these real short thrills you know, in terms of like a social event and then have to quickly get back into work or, or something mm. like that. Not really enjoying my my friends and family. And for five years, I didn't have a partner, you know, like, of course, like I, I dated, but like yeah. I didn't have a boyfriend. It's and hard to focus on someone when you're that definitely, dedicated to your work. Definitely. Right? But then I think I got to a point sort of around 27 years of age where I thought like something's got to give, you know, I can build this amazing empire, but like, what if I come home to an empty house every night? And I know that that is a common question mark for a lot of you know founders and entrepreneurs. And I definitely don't regret having to do my time to get to the point where I can, you know, sell the business, step away, found yeah. you know love and all that kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, there was this sense of like, I know that there's a life that is meant to be lived, and I'm not living it. And I I had a lot of questions at that at that time but not a lot of answers and obviously they've come through making changes and hard decisions and things like that but yeah just to your question like I just think there's a huge I can't stress enough that connection to yourself and to the life that you're living outside of commercial decision making business you know of course your career is going to be a big part of it but it's not all of it you know yeah. that's like a huge thing that I've learned. I love that. And for me, that's so important. Like I've, I've had a very unique experience in my 26 years of life where I've seen, like I've been around the hospital system a lot with my health mm -hmm. and I'm thankfully very well, but I've watched and observed people and spoken to people out of curiosity who have been quite unwell in yeah. those situations. And I find, and, and I watch a lot of content around it and it's probably what inspires a lot of what I do mm -hmm. here and the questions I ask. And it seems that the regret of the dying or people who are sick or people who have lived a, a large portion of their life and reflected back is yeah. lack of connection with family yeah. and friends, not appreciating, appreciating that in the moment. Mm -hmm. um, the fear of like risk and like taking chances yeah, on themselves. Yeah, it's and, true. and all of these things that you start to realize once you've had some success and you look back on it and reflect. And there was a fella for me that's been super formative in my journey. I met him in hospital about three or four years ago. His name was Ernie. Ernie was only in his mid sixties and my mum had actually sold him cars. And that's kind of how we bumped into that's each cool. other in the, in the hall one day. And every afternoon at two o'clock, the tea and biscuit cart would come around and within five minutes of me getting mine, he'd stroll into my room with his cup of tea and a few bickies and we'd sit and we'd just have a chat. And we spoke for about an hour every day for two weeks. And I can honestly say that, so he was a prison guard and like looked after guys like Malat. Mm, yeah. So like he had a really interesting career and he was really dedicated to that, but we never really spoke about it. We brushed over it once and every conversation was around his grandkids, what he loved about them, yeah. you know, the time that he got to spend with them. He's, I think he was married three times and divorced yeah. three times, yeah. but still was great mates with all of his wives. And we just had these really deep conversations about life. And I remember as a 23 year old at the time sitting there and thinking, far out, I've been so career driven for the past year and a half, two years of my life that I forgot who I was. Like everything about me, you said 
been Jade from Equolution. Yeah. I was the guy that would go out to have a couple of drinks after work on a Friday. And, you know, we're from Wollongong. So Wollongong's it's like a city, but it's kind of like a yep. small town, right? And everyone knows everyone. Yeah. And the one thing without fail I'd be asked every time someone seen me was, hey, Brad, how's the market? Yeah, yeah. And I was like, who am I outside yeah, of real estate? Yeah. Because really, when it's not my family, like that's all anyone ever asked me. Yeah. And there was this like loss of identity. And when you mentioned earlier on in this podcast, you said that you'd got to a point in the business where you'd kind of ticked off all of your goals. Mm -hmm. It made me really curious about that question, how important it is to focus on life and yourself as that overarching purpose and understanding the quest that you're on. Because I think when the the focus is so on the business and the specific of what you're trying to achieve, you definitely get to a point where you're like, I've kind of reached it. Yeah. A hundred percent. And I like, just on that note, when we talk about, you know, having these realizations that like, 26 27 like in reality it's still quite young you know so it's young. not over yeah. <laughs> you know it's not it, by any any means it's it's not over um i think they're the best times to have those, those lessons i'm glad you know i'm here at 30 as i am having gone through the last 12 months as mm. it happened then 35 40 not that it matters but it's just like it's nice to grab these things earlier definitely than, than anything else so then you can you know make a change if a change is required and turn the ship around. Like one thing that, you know, one of my biggest regrets I would say in the whole business journey was just like one, forgetting who I was, two, forgetting my family. Like, yeah. and, I, and I'm fine to ad- admit that. It's not obviously pleasant. It's a bit grim thought. But like, you know, I was just so caught up in my work that like I have the most amazing family that I barely saw. And that goes for friends as well. You know, I miss it. I missed out on heaps of stuff and I'm not sad about that. Um, everything happened as it, as it meant to, but, of course. but like one of, one of the most influential people in my life is my, my grandfather. And I think there's something to be said about that older age wisdom, because it's so like true. nothing that we would ever understand because they've seen so much life. It's got nothing to do with business. It's got nothing to do with commercial decision-making, financial pivots, anything like that. It's just this wisdom and this grasp on life and what it actually means, you know. And my pop is is one of the most influential people on me and he, he he just always said to me, he's like, I just want to see you more. I just want to see you more. I want to see you be happy and I want to see you be happy with someone. And, you know, that stuck it really did because I knew that that was you know I met my partner six months ago and it was one of those you know when you know situations and you know when that did happen I was like I get it now like I get it you know I will let all the business stuff happen I'll never take my eye off the prize but I will also never disregard this factor of life that is so big now I love that you say that because I often, I was actually thinking about it this week, listening to a few different shows and I'd listened to a bunch of podcasts in the space of a week where there was almost two opposite ends of the spectrum Mm -hmm. like this. You never need anyone. You can go through life solo. And then this podcast that was like, well, actually, no, like you should do whatever you can to to find that love or to find that significant other that you live life with. And I think about it a lot and I know that definitely the experiences in my life are richer for the people that are right. around me yeah. when, I'm, when I'm doing those things. And I think if I reflect back on all the proudest moments of my life, the first thing I think of is the people that were there with me at that moment, who celebrated with yeah. me, who were there to support me, um, whether it be a bad situation yeah. or a, a good one. Like those people are so formative and, and I think I definitely agree with you. Yeah. Well, actually, I don't think, I know I yeah, definitely yeah. agree with you on this, that you know, it's so important to have those people to share life with. Yeah, it's true. I think there's something really empowering about being on your own and and that single time and all that kind of stuff. And I I definitely had that, but oh God, I was done with it when I was, when I, just before I met my partner, I was like, I've had so much time by myself. It's it's surely got to be soon that he comes, you know, like, where is he? (laughs) Um, And I did, I had, yeah, I just had a lot of years on my own. And it's funny, I was telling my sister the other day, my sister's newly single. And I was like trying to encourage her to, to get out there and date. She's like, no, nah, I'm done with men. Yeah. I was like, seriously, Zara, if I could shake my older self, my former self, yeah. I would just say, just don't worry about 
the person coming yeah. along because they will they do eventually yeah. show up in your life when they're meant to but until then I think there's something to be said about that time by yourself mm. um I love my life with my partner now but like I think back to the time where you know I had my own apartment in the city and I was doing so well at work and just walking by the harbor each day and walking into the apartment and you know a day well done and sitting down and having dinner by myself like there is a sadness to something like that if it's done for year after year yeah, after year after year but if you knew that that was only temporary you would lap it up as like this is this is the a me time that won't come again yeah. you know unless I, you get divorced but we yeah. hope that doesn't happen <laughs> <laughs> hey, there's, there's plenty of fish in the sea, as they say. Yeah, hundred percent. There's a quote that I, I listened to on a podcast recently. It was actually it was a live like Instagram chat. Mm-hmm. You know, Big Sean mm, and yep. his partner Gene. I think it's Gene. You pronounce it Ico. Mm-hmm. And they were on a live together, and she asked he asked her a question, something along the lines of like, "Could you live without me?" And she was like, "Yes, I could." And he goes, "Oh, I'm interested. Mm. Why do you say that?" And she said, "Because." I don't need anyone to complete me. I need someone to compliment me. Mm. And I think that really speaks to what you, you're sort of saying there and touching to. Like if you can be, when, you, when you're by yourself, when you've got that single time, like allow it to be very formative and to get to the bottom of who you are mm-hmm. as a person, the journey you're on, what you need and w- what does signal a really good partner for you. Yep. So you know when you see it. Yeah. But then when you find someone, like you said, you don't drop your goals. You don't change your direction. Yeah. You, you know who you are, you know what direction you're in, but it complements your life. And, yeah. And it's a beautiful place to be in. It's, it honestly does. And even lately, like I've gone through probably the most high stress six months that I've had since I've met him. Yeah. And when I met him, I was sort of just like, okay, this is a bit of a shambles. I've just started this new business. Yeah. Um, I am selling my old one in a bit of a legal moment at the moment. Mm. <laughs> um, so just excuse like the roller coaster that you're just about to go on. But in saying that as well, it w- he, we were so yin and yang with it, you know, like when I would be so flustered and just like, you know, in touch with the lawyers, mediation session, whatever, and just vent to him, he'd just be like so the opposite of how I was, yeah. you know, but in a complimentary sort of way in like a, you know, I'd be uptight and he'd be like, everything will work out, you know, it'll work out the way that it's meant to take the instructions, follow what they're telling you. You know, it was just really nice to experience that i'm used to holding the fort on my own so it was nice to when you say compliment um you know you that's exactly what this relationship has has done to this chapter of my life it's just been complimentary you know just the support the different perspective even you know i think something when you're on your own you get used to so often is consulting you and only you yeah um which leaves for pretty much your way or the highway and it's just nice to open up to another opinion um of course that might be driven by different factors to you but it's a nice way to look at something from you know an accident could happen on the road and someone on one side of the road could see something completely different to the other side of the road yeah it's nice to see those two sides definitely and i will say obviously i know you a little bit better after an hour of chatting but i only know you from the surface level but looking at you over the course of the last few months you you I definitely noticed something on your social presence where you seem very happy yeah. and in a very good place in your life. So yeah. that's obviously nice to Thank see. Thank you. I appreciate oh, Pleasure. That. Yeah. I, I want to dive that. into the last little bit of this podcast. It's yeah. kind of a new segment mm-hmm. and I wanted it to be something that almost serves as a trailer for the episode. So okay. the people listening to or watching this might be getting this as a short few minute segment that's okay. like a trailer to why they should see this okay. or it might be like the perfect conclusion to the great chat that we've had and it's five questions they're the same five questions for every guest they're yep. relatively rapid fire i probably draw them out a little bit okay but i want to go through them with you so the first is if you could recommend one book or one podcast to someone listening what would it be obviously this podcast is fabulous. <laughs> what but a I'm great assuming, answer. I'm assuming they'll need another one. Yeah. Impact Theory. Um, um, by the Tom. Fa- Yes, I am huge. I don't think he can do any wrong, can he, in terms of content. He's amazing. Even his, the way him and his wife complement each other. Yeah. Um, they're both fantastic in content. Yeah. They're great. What I love about his, 
pretty much his philosophy on life is he's obviously a commercial man that has had huge success, um, which I love. And as a result, you know, he has a, a caliber of people that he attracts in, in, in his podcast studio that are of just this, you know, league of their own type thing. Um, but I also love his hunger for knowledge and education in the health and fitness space yep. because I do really believe if you if you speak to a lot of high performers, they'll be hugely in touch with their nutrition and also um, training as well. So true. I think the, the, the multifaceted human in terms of covering mindset, health, your fitness, your overall wellness, I think that that is usually not unique to just one high performer. I think it's an across the board thing. It's just like those important pillars of life, right? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Question number two, the one skill that you recommend mastering that significantly improved your life? Copywriting. I know that's really bizarre yeah. to say, but if I think you can, I think if you can tell your story through your words and captivate through writing, I think you can sell anything underwater. So, you know what, this is the part where I draw out the rapid fire. Cause I want to comment on that. My journal entry this morning was language is everything. I've noticed lately, like I listen to a lot of podcasts and I watch mm -hmm. a lot of stuff. And I notice sometimes there's people who are very specific on their use of language and words and very specific on the context of what that word means to them. Example, Mo Gord at the other day spoke about, he said, I don't like to call it a life journey. I like to call it a life quest. The quest mm. is open. The journey has a final destination. And I remember sitting listening to that and thinking, is that maybe a little bit too picky on the use of language? But then I, th I sat back and reflected and I thought, well, language is everything. It does. Like, like if you shut your eyes and people fire words at you, you have, they have connotations, they have imagery. If you're a creative brain, you will sit with that and paint a picture in your mind. And I almost think of words as like blinkers, like yeah. you can turn particular words on and they can go left or right in that picture, you know? Definitely. And I just think, I think it's the most powerful skill. And I, I did go through a bit of a identity crisis in my evolution time as a marketer thinking, can all I do is write, but no, like mm. <laughs> it's not just, it doesn't end, it doesn't start and finish there. Like it Definitely. is the most powerful thing that I think you can have as, as a skill set. And I might be biased, but you know, I'd love to have numbers as my skill set. <laughs> and in which case I might say like, oh, maths and finance yeah. and understanding of money. But no, I honestly, I, I really think copywriting is a powerful skill. And I just think that if you get good at story, like story yep. is so powerful. The yeah. story you tell yourself, the story of yourself that you told to others, like you said, it can really form your direction. So I love that answer. Yeah, yeah. Number three, the one challenge that's required the most personal growth to overcome. Oh, leaving my business. It yeah. was, you know, that was a whole discovery, relearning. Yeah. No ego had to kind of could have fall, kind of could have felt like a fall from grace at the time if I didn't have the mindset to know that it was the start of something new but yeah it was hard it was really hard I love it and if this is a trailer for you you need to listen to the episode mm -hmm. because of that number four is the one daily habit or ritual that if you could only pick one if you could only pick one thing in your life outside of your work that you think sets you up for success, what would that be? Exercise, without Exercise. a doubt, no hesitation. Is there a specific style that works for you? No, nah, I just, I have this adamancy that each morning I just have to move my body or yep. sweat at some point in the day, you know? Like I, I love it. I do, I love long distance running. Um, this is the part where I sign you up for a charity marathon <laughs> in about a year's Honestly, time. I'll do it. Come, come with us. I'll do it. I did Movember, I ran a marathon for Movember um, back in November and that was honestly I feel like when it's a charity event you find something inside you that's very special yeah. love it well Fernie's laughing behind the camera because I've forced him to run too now so well, we're in it together <laughs> yeah so it's Team. um yeah 42 for CF we raise money for cystic fibrosis Australia yeah. so unreal no I'll I have can't to let you know next time yeah definitely definitely but no without a doubt exercise like I honestly think that it can completely change your mindset I'm pretty good with Diet, obviously I've come from an evolution background, so it's an 80-20 approach for me. Um, and I've become recently far more cleaner in my diet than I previously yeah. were was. Um, and I think that that 
that's also a bit of a growth thing too and a bit of a pivot in my own personal life. Um, Because I do think the way that you treat your body in both your habits and your eating and and exercise and whatnot is a reflection of your self-love. Definitely. Um, And so I think the better you are to yourself, the better you operate and perform. For sure. Let me tell you, I got the 80-20 the wrong way around on the weekend, so I'm cleaning it up today. There was a salad before I drove up here, so I didn't go into Macca's. <laughs> the last question for me, which is almost, it's my, it's my favorite question for mm-hmm. me. It's, this is so important. And I think this is your opportunity to really speak to the people that are watching or listening this to this. If you could share one message with this audience and encourage them to act on it, to make it a part of who they are and what they believe, what would that be? I don't want to be cliche in this. But I, I think it's just so important to wake up and love what you do. I think in any pursuit, you know, whether that be to a goal that is outside of work or whether it be a career goal or whether you're building a business or training for a marathon, no matter what it is, I think that there's going to be tough parts of any, anything that's worth having won't, won't often come easy. But I just think if you're hating the process more than you're hating the potential of achieving the goal, then you're probably on the wrong path and like just don't be afraid to jump off it. You know, as good as it may look on paper or as good as it might seem in theory, if something in you doesn't feel right, then it's you've got to act on it. And I think that anyone who stays in something and then complains that they don't like it, I think... They, they really only have themselves to blame. I think doing something without passion is like driving a car without vision. Like I just think you're going, I love that. You're, you had no way, you know, it's, it's yeah, just, I love a, that. it's a slippery slope. Um, there's a saying that I, I have, and I've said it, I've said it previously, but you can win a rat race, but you'll always be a rat. And I think that that couldn't be more true for, you know, being on a path and pursuing something that, you just feel emptiness. And I, I think there's, there's nothing better than, than just loving what you're doing. And if you've had that feeling before, you would know that if you don't have that, you've got to try and find it again. I know it too well. I feel it. And thank you so much for this. Like thank it's, you for having me. Look, sitting down with you, it's no surprise to me now, like getting to know you over this last hour and a bit. <coughs> There's no surprise to me why you're successful. I think there's you just... You got me at a very zen, reflective time. I mean, I've just like come out of turmoil so, <laughs> and rebuilt my entire life. So it's probably a good a good time. And I probably seem like Yoda now <laughs> in comparison to we all have what I was that. what I was maybe 12 months ago, just up in arms. But yeah, look, I, I think I'll always be a business person. That's just, that's who I am. Um, and now what I do, you know, yeah. um, but... Ultimately, now I'm a person that lives my life and I'm really happy for that. Well, not that you need to hear it from me, (coughs) but I think you should be really proud of your journey. I'm really excited for this next step for you. And it's just been an absolute pleasure to have you here on the show. I'm going to make sure that every one of your social um, tags, all of the links to your business are all in the show description. So for anyone listening or watching, make sure you head across, give that the love it deserves. And be sure to hit that follow or subscribe button. Leave a rating and review, five star preferably. <laughs> um, but super grateful for anyone who tuned in. It means the world to me. So thank you so thank much. Thank you Jay. for having me. My thank pleasure. You.